Amen, amen. Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 and verse 6 and it says the following. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us. Somebody say he loves me. Loved us and washed us. Somebody say he washed you from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to our God the Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. And somebody say amen. amen. You know the Bible says in here that Jesus Christ loved us. You know one of the many reasons we love God's presence. We sometimes sing that we love God's presence and what that means is we love God. But I have a news for you today. God loves your presence. One of the reasons we come to prayers here in the mornings at five in the morning and six in the morning before we before work it's not only because we love God's presence God loves our presence so much that he created it he had himself and angels for eternity but he wanted you and he wanted me that's why he created you and when your presence left God God sent his son to die on the cross to bring you back one of the reasons you have to go to prayer is not only because you need God's presence. God wants yours. He loves us. And then he says he washed us with his precious blood. And then he says that he made us. Somebody say he made me. See uh, most of the things you wear were made in China, made in, uh, made in Mexico. But, but you, 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 not what you wear but you were made by God. And you were made to be a priest and a king. A career is something you choose. A calling is chosen for you. A career is what makes you money. A calling is what brings God glory. A career is what you can change. Different seasons of life, different opportunities you can jump from one to another. Your calling is what is not changeable and this is your calling. If you come today and you say, I want to know what God wants me to do with my life. I have an answer for you today. And this is what God wants you to do with your life. To be a priest and to be a king. You want it to be a president? God wants you to be something higher. <laughs> higher than Donald Trump. Higher than Barack Obama. Higher than Putin. <laughs> higher than Putin, please, Jesus name, amen. <laughs> God has a calling for your life and your calling is to be a priest. You're like man not the priest for sure. I'm not that talking about that kind of priest that you've been watching in the movies or maybe the church that you went to. A priest. I'm not talking about having a position in the local church where you are a priest. I'm talking about a position before God as a priest where you minister to him and a king where in life you walk in dominion, in life you walk in authority. This is in the New Testament where Jesus Christ tells us not only God created us in the beginning to have dominion. It's interesting in the beginning the first thing God gives to a man is dominion. And the first place God places a man is in Garden of Eden. And in here Jesus tells us that because we've lost it through sin, God comes and he reclaims that and he says now I am putting you back. I'm making you a priest. As a priest you serve God. You love God. You worship God. You bring God just an offering of things, thanksgiving. And then he says the second side of that coin, I'm making you a king in this world and in this life. Amen. You know for the longest time during the dark ages there was a very prevalent teaching especially in a in the catholic church where catholic means universal in the church in, in a catholic church where and this has changed now but where a priest was the only one who can stand between you and god but if you wanted to know anything about god you had to go through a priest actually even normal members of the church didn't have access to a bible the only Bible they knew was the Bible that the priest explained to them. They couldn't go to God by themselves. They had to go through a priest. And even then a priest started to manipulate few things and then even charge people with money. But things have changed in the last few hundred years where in the same thing even in the Catholic Church and the Christian Church where today we have an understanding of a priesthood of all believers. 
what that means is this is the priest is not only a guy who wears a long robe and who is on the staff in the church a priest is every Christian and he has the same access to God at that Pope Francis, Pastor Vlad, Pastor Vasily, every single person is a priest. That does not mean that you don't need pastors. That doesn't mean you don't need mentors. It doesn't mean we don't need prophets. But it simply means that they bring addition. They don't replace my relationship with God. They supplement my relationship with God. You and I are a priest. Some, somebody say, I'm a priest. You are a priest. Now the priest part, most of us got that under control. We're like, yeah, I understand. I can go to God without a priest. But the second part is the king. I believe God is restoring in our generation another revelation that is extremely powerful. Because most of us in here, we believe you can go to God without a priest. But most of us do not believe you can do same thing that another man of God that heals the sick, raises the dead and cleanses the lepers. Most of us do not believe we can do that. Only they can do that. Because they are better, holier, sinless. They are probably got some wings under their, on the back that they're hiding. They got a, something unique about them that nobody else has and they are unique and special and no one else can heal the sick but them. No one else can cast out demons by them. No one else can move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit by them. And God in this generation and in this age, the way He changed when the church was struggling and only few people could reach to God and the rest of the people had to come through them. And today God is changing the same thing about the kingdom where He wants you to be the royal kingdom. The royal priesthood means the kingdom and the priesthood had to be together and it's not just for few chosen it's for every person who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ can I get a witness in this place you are a king you have an assignment the Bible makes us to understand everyone who believes in Jesus Jesus says those who believe in me these signs will follow them. Jesus said to his followers, things I do, you will do and even more. The followers of Jesus, if this was just a flaky statement or just to pump up the crowd, then Jesus wouldn't ask his followers, imagine this, Jesus is the hero. He heals the sick. He's only 30 something years of age. He's just beginning. He's a young, young man physically. He's not old. He's not about to retire. But already on the first day of his ministry, he finds disciples. He gives them, not only says, guys, I want you to watch me, but he gives them power to heal the sick. Not when he's dead. When he's alive. It's like, it's his job. He hasn't even done it for long. And he says, guys, I want you to already start doing that. Don't wait until I die already start practicing and the Bible says before he will go to the city he will send these disciples who had no theological training who godliness their godliness was nothing to write home about who had issue with their mouth who had issues with their money and who had issue with many many other things and these guys would go into the cities and prepare things for Jesus not by just renting a Colosseum not by just going and screening people for a crusade not just by finding churches who will bring people together. The way they prepare the city for Jesus is by healing the sick and leaving all the heavy cases for Jesus. They did the smaller things and Jesus did the rest. And then Jesus died. He says, guys, now I'm going to be gone and you're going to do the small cases and the heavy cases. And you already have experience. And when he went to heaven, that's exactly what disciples did. Is they went around, not only they knew, we have a relationship with God through Jesus. We don't need a high priest. We respect high priest. We love a high priest. But we have Jesus who is our high priest. And they knew a second thing that is extremely important to the development of your Christian life. Is that we are like Jesus in this world. We are not perfect like him. But we are washed by the blood of Jesus. And he made us to be kings. China makes your t-shirt to be worn by you, worn by you. Jesus made you to be a king. You have to function in what you've been made to be. Not just to survive, 
not just to come and pay your tithe and just go home not just to simply sit at church not just to make the living and wait for your retirement you are called by God to be a priest and to be a king the Bible doesn't tell us to pray for the sick Jesus tells you to heal them I remember the first time I watched a video where TB Joshua or people asked TB Joshua to heal them I was offended I was like who does he think he is how do people dare to ask this man to heal them only Jesus heals until I read in the Bible where my Jesus told his disciples heal the sick he didn't tell them pray for them he said heal them until in the Bible you see John and Peter going to a temple and the man sitting there asking for alms and Peter and John says gold and silver I don't have what I have I give you and he doesn't say may God according to his will if he wants to today in a good mood wants to raise you up maybe perhaps let me pray for you no he says in Jesus name rise and walk they healed them now we know of course through the power of the name of Jesus but Jesus called us to do the same amen he called us to do the same there was a story in the king of Israel in the old testament where a guy was a leper and he wasn't a Jew he was a Syrian and he decided to go to the king of Israel to, to get healing so he writes a letter from his king comes to the king of Israel say hey listen I got leprosy can you take care of it and king of Israel read that letter he tore his clothes apart he says do you think I'm God what makes you think I can remove your leprosy and the guy is like I think he replied him he's like well there's a little girl in the house and she told me that you guys and your God does these things and the king of Israel tore his clothes and he says I can't do this that's that's God does that I cannot do that when that happened a prophet in Israel sends a messenger to the king of Israel say listen dude no need to tear your clothes apart send that man to me that everyone will know that is a prophet of God in the land of Israel and it's interesting the prophet didn't come to Naaman and says why did you come to us do you think I'm God how can I remove your leprosy the prophet was a boss he came out and he says go to that river dunk yourself seven times and the seventh time your skin will be as clean as the baby's skin and prophet went about his business and that's exactly what happened most of us we react like that king in the face of people's problems we feel hopeless we feel like there's nothing I can do and it's good to feel hopeless but not in front of people you have to be hopeless in front of God you have to wait upon God seek God as a priest say God I am nobody God my life I just without you I am nobody but with you I can do anything but when we come out of that place we have to be like Elisha and say there is a God in Israel and if you come I will pray for you and God will perform a miracle he will do what only he can do I am a priest in my private but in public you and I are a king this has been brewing inside of me for the past few weeks and it started with the fact when I started to notice when our people come in contact with others who have sicknesses and who have issues or certain challenges that our people have been trained to give every one of these people an advice and this is how the advice goes you got a demon and you have to come for a prayer line both of these are very good very good the first one especially very good the second one is good but there is something better you have to understand God called you not just someone to take the position of praying for deliverance and praying for healing if your Christian life involves in prayer you go to God on your own you don't wait for me pastor or someone to be here and morning prayer and you say okay you're here now I can pray you don't have that mindset even though you respect the pastors even though you respect the leaders yet in the area of authority most of us we push that over on a prayer line on anointing water on the 
race to deliver with a wise man that she and this is incredibly awesome and it's important God raised this man not to take authority from you but to show you an example of how far you can grow but most of us get intimidated and we think that they replace our need and responsibility to be kings in our God amen you may say I'm not holy enough well you don't know them the challenge is we compare our background with their front stage performance and they're not the same God wants to use you and he wants to use me in this calling in Jesus name can somebody say amen I just want to share with you two in the conclusion two tips one is we have to wait upon God as priests wait upon God as priests if we fail as priests we cannot succeed as kings if we fail as priests we cannot succeed as kings uh, most of you remember the story about King David and Saul when Samuel told King Saul to wait upon him for seven days and Saul was waited, waiting, waiting, waiting for Samuel and Samuel didn't come and the Philistines was already approaching and everybody was kind of leaving uh, King Saul and so he got really discouraged so he decided to you know I don't have much time to wait for him and so he left this whole waiting thing and quickly ran into the battle and King Saul wasn't waiting upon God he waited very little and then just ran into the battle the interesting and fascinating part is that when he was in the battle Goliath came out and Goliath kept saying nasty things morning and evening and King Saul had no guts no passion and power to fight Goliath actually King Saul waited for something I don't think he knew what he was waiting for whether he was waiting maybe for Philistines to get tired of screaming maybe he was waiting for God supernatural to come and to destroy them maybe he was waiting for Samuel I don't know but what I see is that for 40 days King Saul is waiting he couldn't wait for seven days for a prophet and now waits for 40 days and now doesn't know what he's waiting for you cannot function as a king if you fail as a priest if you don't wait upon God you're gonna wait upon the devil to leave you're gonna wait for God to supernaturally maybe come and just do they will be always waiting King Saul was waiting at the wrong place he should have been waiting in his prayer closet but he wasn't waiting in his prayer closet instead of that he was waiting on the battlefield God wants us to live a life where we develop a personal intimate relationship with Jesus in our personal life where nobody else is watching before you go to work prioritizing your prayer time where you wait upon the Lord where you come and you honestly you become the priest you become the broken person you say Lord I am nobody Lord without you I can do nothing Lord I need you Holy Spirit talk to me Holy Spirit fill me Holy Spirit empower me we do that for a reason so when you come out of that place you come out like David David comes on the field and he sees all of these guys waiting for something and not sure what they're waiting for. David comes out and the Bible says that David says, what's going on here? Why is he still standing? Why is he still talking? What are you guys waiting for? For the king of Saul to jump, to increase the price of the award? What are you guys waiting for? And they looked at him and said, that's interesting perspective that you got here, David. And you're not even a soldier. And David gets his stones, comes out there. And I, don't, I want you to see David doesn't pray. I want you to see that David doesn't ask. David doesn't wait for a prophet. David doesn't even wait for some kind of a sign from heaven. David is only waits for one thing. For that Goliath to finish talking so that David can start talking and send that stone as soon as possible. And guess what happens? A miracle happened. We wait upon God privately so that we can work with God publicly. We develop relationship with God privately so we can take risks publicly. Relationship with God in private that doesn't lead to taking risks in public brings no reward 
David had a relationship with God in private only he and God knew that relationship he knew that relationship and he he knew about God's heart he knew about the power of all the Holy Spirit he saw how God worked privately in his life when God protected him from a lion and from the bear but what changed David's public life what changed David's finances what changed the fact that at 17 years of age with most of the guys were getting out of their diapers and finally trying to get over the fact that they play video games and want fleshly things and David got King's daughter as a wife his whole household removed from taxes and bunch of bunch of money why because David said in private life others are going to be sleeping sleeping others are going to be messing around I'm going to build my relationship with God and when I come out in public I will not be a coward or a chicken I am gonna take risks with God and he took risks with God and there came reward I just have something very simple to share with you relationship privately must lead to risks publicly risk publicly that is not based on a relationship privately always leads to a ruin when a person begins to recklessly aim for things that are bigger than themselves and have no private life with God to sustain them, they will always get disappointed. King Saul couldn't even take those risks because there was no power to challenge him to take those risks. But the other problem is this, is when you build a relationship with God but you're afraid to throw the stone. You build a relationship with God but you come out on the field and you're afraid to take the first step and to do and to give what you have and trust that God will see you through. A reward does not come without these two things. Relationship and risk. And risk. David took a risk. If you think that David knew, walked into the meeting with Goliath and hundred percent he knew he's gonna defeat him. Not true. David took a risk. Not having a prophetic word not having an angel to visit him last night, not having a little star from heaven pointing down like the wise man, he's gonna go down. He took a risk and God honored that risk. This can be a year of reward for us. All of the single people, you know the reward for defeating a Goliath? God can bless you with his child, with his blessing. In the area of relationships did you know that David wasn't chasing a woman David was chasing a relationship with God and taking risks and the reward came God gave him a woman most of us are believing right now there's this uh, the what do you call the, the gambling thing that you, the powerball Lord Jesus I'm not gonna ask how many of you guys actually bought that so I'm like man this is my way to get out of debt it's my this prosperity I know the Lord has a breakthrough for me if I can just win just 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 a few million dollars if you win God bless you just make sure you tithe but but for most of us we're not gonna win that there's actually a higher chances of you become you being canonized as a saint by Pope Francis than winning that there's a higher chances of you meeting, meeting an alien than actually winning that so very the chances are extremely low but if you take risks with God in public there will always be reward financial reward can somebody say amen if you take risks with God in public if you take risks with God some of you you will take risks if you have a relationship but some of us the moment we have a relationship God leads us to a life of risk risk is a risk if it has no relationship behind it but a risk is actually a stepping stone for a reward if a relationship is sustaining it. I want to challenge every person this year. When you meet a sick person and you invite, invite them to church. Don't just tell them come to church and they'll pray for you. Say can I pray for you? Take a risk. You say but, but, but they're deaf. Take a risk. But what if nothing happens? Take a risk. What if something happens? Well they're, they're on the crutches. What if nothing happens? What if something happens? I remember when I went to California once and I went into a room where there was uh, youth pastors and one youth pastor came on crutches. The moment I saw his bruised up leg, I knew it right away. He's not walking out of that camp on those crutches. I took a risk and on the service, I simply declared, I said, God is going to heal people today. And I started to 
proclaim healing. When people came up, I think I've seen most people healed in that camp. Even when I was in right now in Carolina, people still were talking about that camp. And one of those people that came up, it dawned on me later, it was the youth pastor without crutches. Those crutches were left there on the field. The next morning, he went to airport. I went to look for them. How does God reward? Because I have a relationship with him. But it's not relationship that brings the reward. It's relationship that pushes me into a risk. If I am afraid to take a risk, I avoid my reward. I won't have a reward in my life if I don't take risks. But I can't take risks if I don't have a relationship. Can somebody say amen? You have to take risks. If somebody comes to you and it's the repeated cycle, curses in their life, please, it's good to sign them up for a prayer line. But you need to take a risk. You need to pray for them and you say, you need to say, can I agree with you right now? Can we renounce those curses? So when you come for prayer line, anything else that needs to be done, they'll do it. I need to take that risk because I am a king and I am a priest to my God. You are that person. Can somebody say amen? God will bless you in your relationships. God will bless you in your finances. And when David defeated Goliath, the Bible says David got promoted. No more sheep. The Bible says he got called into the palace. And most of us want promotion. And I give you the key. Relationship in private, which will push you to taking risks in public. Some people will take a risk in starting a business. Some will take a risk in starting or going to a new job. Some will take a risk going to school when they are maybe financially not doing well right now. Some will take a risk. Any risk that is initiated by a relationship always leads to reward. Anytime you don't have a relationship, you become a coward. You have a weak spine. You are taller than anybody else like King Saul. But you're a weak sauce. The Goliath comes out, screams and you're standing there not sure. Peeing in your pants. Why? Because instead of spending time waiting for Samuel for seven days now you're waiting for 40 days for someone to come and rescue you out of this trouble never underestimate the power of your relationship with God and never underestimate the power it does when it stiffens your spine and makes you courageous and makes you bold in the face of challenges and difficult situations and you sometimes will fly blind feeling like you're flying blind but if it's backed up by relationship you're never flying blind you're flying into your promotion, you're flying into your breakthrough and you're flying into a relationship breakthrough in your life. Can somebody say amen? This is the year of reward only for risk takers. Some of you took a risk by tithing. Others of us took a risk when we spend time with God in the morning and you may say, I'm, I could have got a little bit more of sleep. I could have got a little bit more of that. You took a risk when on Friday night, you know, you may have a little homework but you said, I'm going to come and I'm going to learn how to be a leader. I took a risk. I'm gonna start discipling other people. I know I just came out of this bad life and so many people go back to that bad life and I don't want to wait for 10 years to find out if I'm ready. I want to take a risk and walk with God as far from that sin as possible. If you meet God at the area of risk, you will meet God at the area of reward. God's reward is waiting for you but it's not waiting for you on the other side without risk. Take a risk with God. Pray for the sick. Take a risk with God. When somebody has nightmares, lay hands upon them and pray for them. If nothing happens, well there's prayer line. But don't be afraid. Do not use prayer line as an excuse for you not to take your risk. Do not use a Wednesday night service as an excuse not to lead somebody to Jesus Christ but just to invite them. It is good to invite them but many of us, you also know how to invite them to Jesus and get them saved. And then take a picture with them, post it on Slack and say, I just brought somebody to Jesus. Take a risk and you will see every word in your life in Jesus' name. I remember hearing a story from Bethel, Bethel Church in Redding, California where one young man, Chris, went to Walmart to get some groceries. And as he saw that the cash register lady, she had a brace on her, on her arm. And so he asked, can I pray for you while you're scanning my things? And she said, yes. He prayed for her and took a risk asking her to remove the brace. She removed the brace and she was shocked because the pain was gone and she started to move. She says, I can't believe it. She started crying and he took another risk of saying, can I borrow your speaker? You know at the, every cashier they have that little speaker. It goes all around the whole Walmart. She said, yes. When they are under influence of the Holy Spirit, they could do little crazy things. 
he took the speaker he says on the cash register number nine God is moving if you're sick line up that's exactly what he did he went to the store to get to get things to get groceries and end up seven eight people lining up and one by one start praying before of course management got involved and so he got him healed took the groceries went back home that kind of life exists when there is relationship in private and risk in public I'm not saying for you to take a microphone from your job or get in front of a cafeteria on your like John the Baptist on the, on the top of the table and start screaming but I want to tell you something you need to take risks if you want to see reward in your life in Jesus name this year is going to be a year we're going to see the glory of God we're going to see God's reward in our life I prophesy that into your life in Jesus mighty name can somebody say amen Hallelujah.